evening, want to remind you that there is another service. The Good Friday service is tomorrow night. And uh, that one is going to be not a happy service. And I'll be asking you to uh, don't even talk to one another while you're in the church. Leave. You can talk when you get outside. But it's going to be just a real like, a, oh man, this is the most sad, boring place to be. But it's Good Friday, okay? There, there, there will be no slamming of the book this year, just so some of you know that. It'll be, just, it'll be different from years before as well. But uh, tonight will also be a little bit different than what you're probably used to as well. But it will be, hopefully, meaningful. That's what I like. I like meaningful things. Don't do them just for making things different. I do them with a purpose in mind. So with that, let's have a word of prayer together. But before I pray, I just want to know, is there any prayer requests out there? Do you have one tonight that you would like to have me especially pray for? I'm not telling you that you have to pray for it. I just want to know what it is. Steve. Where's, where's this at? Um, they live down in Georgia. Oh, in Georgia. Okay. 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 Yeah. Tough stuff. It's tough stuff. Okay, well, thanks for bringing that up. Nancy. Is he from Everly? Okay. His sister. Okay. Right. Anybody else? Can you hear me, Bob? Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right, let's go. Let's have a prayer together. Nancy. Yeah, and also, Shirley Berry, she had just been released from the hospital uh, when she went four days uh, recovered from an infection. Mm-hmm. And now she's uh, a long recovery. Is she back home? Back home. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's go to the to the Lord, shall we? Heavenly Father, we know that uh, we continue to celebrate what you instituted way back over 2,000 years ago, probably. When it comes to the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, it comes with a lot of different names. But it was a very intimate time with your followers, and Lord, tonight we pray that it will also be an intimate time with us who have gathered together. And I don't know what the expectations are of people who've come here tonight, but I just uh, know that you are here with us, and that's really what's the most important. And so, Lord, we bring these prayer requests to you. We think of the, the request that Steve made tonight, Lord, when there's someone who is definitely young compared to me, that uh, is in need of your healing touch in his life with a brain tumor that has been removed, but they didn't get all of it. And Lord, it affects not just him, but it affects a lot of different people who know him and care about him and who love him. And Lord, we pray for John, is it Jensen? Who lost his sister. It's just a lot of sad things, Lord, but yet we know we're coming into this week where there's going to be even more sad things that we'll be talking about here tomorrow night as well. We think of, of Shirley Berry as well. Did I get her name right? Okay. 
Thank you that she is back home. And we know, Lord, that it's not always the quickest way of healing and getting back into the swing of things, but we are grateful that she's home because there's no place like home when it comes to healing and getting better and just being around things that are familiar with you. And so tonight, Lord, even though we're very familiar with, with the things that went on on Monday, Thursday, may tonight be one of those things where the familiar becomes more alive because of what you are going to teach us from your word this evening. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that is here tonight. And uh, it's not the easiest, uh, probably, time to get away and to come to, to a service, but we're grateful for everyone that is here. And there's probably some unspoken requests. Lord, you know everything. We don't even have to be praying to you, but you invite us to pray because you want to hear from us. And so um, you know what's on every heart here this evening, and uh, we are thankful that you do, because you care about us and you love us very much. And so may we draw close to you as you come close to us through this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin by singing a couple of hymns. Uh, Did everyone get a... Did you get a bulletin as you came in? There's one on the chair there. And inside you should have a flyer in it tonight that will have the Apostles' Creed on one side and the other side will be the Lord's Prayer, just so you know that that is going to be taking place later on in the service. But we're going to sing our first song tonight, which is Lead Me to Calvary. And uh, Sharon is the maestro this evening. And... You may begin. <clears throat> King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy corn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels were the light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let my cross for thee even thy cup of grief to share thou hast borne all for me lest I forget Gethsemane lest I forget thine agony lest I forget thy love for me lead me to Calvary who can tell me what the name Gethsemane means? What does Gethsemane mean? It's very simple. Wine press. And the wine press, if you've seen them over in Israel, of course you, you have to be there to go see them, they got big, huge rocks that will be pressed down onto the grapes or whatever they're going to do, and then they, they turn it tight. And so it's a wine press. And so Gethsemane is that for Jesus. When you think of it. He goes there to pray. He goes there to be, and gets betrayed. And it's also, also the place where he said, Lord, if there's any way that this cup can be passed from me, you know, kind of like do it. But at the same time, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. And that happened in Gethsemane. 
And you can kind of see there's pressure there that's building. He, Jesus knows what's ahead of him, but he knows he's the only one that can do what, is, what he's being asked to do. No one else can do it. So our next song is, ta- will take us to the cross. It's called Beneath the Cross of Jesus. of Jesus I fain would take my stand the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land a home within the wilderness a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. There lies beneath its shadow, but on the farther side, the darkness of an awful grave that gapes both deep and wide. And there between us stands the cross, two arms outstretched to save. Like a watchman set to guard the way from the the eternal grave. Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eyes at times can see. The very form of one who suffered there for me. And from my smitten heart with tears, these wonders I confess. The wonders of his glorious love and my unworthy. I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine on his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain, not loss. My sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. Some of those songs are probably familiar with you, and probably some aren't. But they're good songs. Gethsemane, and then going to the cross, and knowing that Jesus died there for, for you and for me. So the message tonight, is, it comes from a different part. I th- really think Ahmad, I think he, sp- he brought this up last Wednesday when we were here. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to just go with verse 15 through 17. It's very short. Where Paul is speaking and he says this, I speak to sensible people. And so am I right now. I'm speaking to sensible people. You here. And judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. This comes from Corinthians. We go from the time when Jesus brought up the communion, what we call communion, he, when he said, I have a new covenant I want to tell you about, and he lifted up the wave, well, he lifted up the bread, he gave, broke the bread, and he gave thanks to his father, and, and he said to his disciples, this is my body. 
And then we took the cup and what was in the cup. He said, when you drink this, the fruit of the vine, then this is my blood given for you. And we find that in Mark's, Mark chapter 14, which is the gospel, verses 22 through 25, when Jesus says this. And he, he says, I'll drink it again with you anew in the kingdom of God. So it's something that Jesus looks forward to doing with us in that day in heaven with him, where it will be him present leading the service, however it will be. And so uh, we go from the upper room in Jerusalem where the disciples got together with Jesus the night that he was going to be betrayed. And now we jump ahead about 20-some years to the Apostle Paul. This is what he is saying to the Corinthians. And Corinth is the name of the city where he's at. And Corinth would be in modern day, what country? Greece. Greece. Yeah. And that's not with uh, Travolta and whatever her name is. That Greece. The country of Greece. And now he, this is like later, from the time that Jesus said this, we go beyond that time. And now Greece is, there are some Jews that live there, but the Apostle Paul goes there and he wants to tell the good news to even the Gentiles. The Greeks are Gentiles. They are also the ones where Greece is a place where there was, at that time, a place of uh, learning. You know, you'd go there for universities, and you'd want to send your child there to get educated. And Paul finds out that in early Christianity, it was not welcomed with open arms wherever he went. You have to keep that in mind. Just because Jesus said this to his disciples and after he was ascended up into heaven, Christianity was something very new. And not everybody believed in Christianity. But it spread. It went out. Even even the apostle Paul did not believe in Christianity. He did not believe in Jesus Christ as a savior. Because he went and he persecuted the church. Anybody who was Christians, he would round them up and he'd haul them back to, to Jerusalem and to try them. And he was there even when the first martyr, Stephen, we have in the book of Acts, was stoned to death. It was Saul who held Stephen's clothes as he was being stoned to death by throwing rocks. But Saul, on his way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus, he saw a bright light. He was blind, but he also heard the voice of Jesus talking to him, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It changed Saul's life, and later on the Lord gave him a new name, which was Paul. And he became one who would go around. He was one of the greatest evangelists, the one that would share the gospel wherever he went. He, rather than fighting the church, he now became a part of the church. And he went on missionary trips, three of them we, that we know of, that we have in scriptures, different places he went to. But Corinth was one of the places that he went to to start a church. And Corinth is a bad place. You don't want to be a part of a church in Corinth. Just read First and Second Corinthians and you'll find out why. <laughs> There's things going on in that church that gives me the heebie-jeebies. I would never want to be a pastor of a church in Corinth. But the reason for that is, is because Corinth was a place where they, in, in Greece they had many gods. They had statues. They had different temples for different gods. And they did things differently because they did not know about Jesus Christ. But when they heard about Jesus Christ, they didn't want to go that direction. They wanted to stick with their own gods that they were worshiping. And so Paul brings up this whole issue of 
being at the Lord's table. Communion. And he needs to teach them as far as what that means. And so that's why I want to go here tonight, is to help you to see what the scriptures say about communion and how it got started. I mean, Paul kept it going, just as we keep it going here over the years as well. So Paul's message to the Greeks is that he wants to teach the believers who do live in Corinth that there is a difference between the sacrifice of Jesus and the sacrifice to idols. Because that's what he's confronted with. There's idol worship big time in Corinth. You have some believers who are still practicing uh, going to the Lord's table, but then you have a whole host of Greeks that do kind of the same thing, but they do it their way, but what, who they're worshiping are their gods and their idols. And there's a big difference between the two. And so Paul comes onto the scene and says, hey, wait a minute. Those who offer a sacrifice to another god or an idol, they are participating at a demonic table. They're actually worshiping demons. What do you think of that? (laughs) So... uh, There's some real issues here that Paul wants to make known to these believers who do live there that not everybody likes you. And what you're doing is so different than what the people here are used to doing. And so the Lord's table is not to be confused with the Corinthians who are worshiping and sacrificing to idols or to other gods. That's that's kind of the the main theme here for Paul. So the teaching point is this, and you find it right here before or after what I just read here tonight, and it's in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, that Paul is saying you cannot take part in both the Lord's table and then to be a part of the table of demons. You can't sacrifice to demons and then still go to the Lord's table. The two do not go together. So if you go to someone's home, you don't ask, if you're in Greece, you don't ask what you're eating. If they got meat, you don't say like, now where'd you get this? Is, was this meat given to the, the sacrifice for the temple, your temple that you go to? Paul says, don't ask. If they set food before you, you just eat it. And he does that because of a conscience. He's thinking of their conscience. Now there's strong believers and there's weak believers. He said if there's someone who's got a weak faith or or just a weak believer, then you who are strong, you don't eat meat. If someone is there who is a believer that says, I don't think you should eat meat. And he just says, if you got a stronger faith, then just don't eat it. Sometimes we make fun of things around here at a potluck. We kind of go like, Oh, who brought the roadkill here tonight? You know? We kind of we chuckle at that. But here, it, what Paul is talking about is be thankful. Always be thankful when you have something to eat. Because God's created everything on this world, and if something is set before you to eat, just give thanks and to eat it. Don't get into the the dogma of things, the doctrine kind of things. Just be thankful that this person has invited you into their home and they want to feed you. But don't ask where they got it from. Now here you can say either fairway or high V. I mean, that's okay. But back then you just wouldn't do that because they did a lot of sacrificing to, to their idols and to their gods and you just don't know how that all how that all goes. But it's, but it's the point that Paul is making is they're, they're, they're worshiping demons. They're not worshiping the one true God. And anything that people put before the one true God then is an idol. It's, it's not something you want to be a part of doing. 
Here's something else that you probably don't know, is uh, the early Christians were accused of having love feasts. You'll find the word love feast, those two words, you'll find it in Jude, verse 12. Jude is right before the book of Revelation. Jude is full of not good stuff. But the, the non-believers, the Gentiles, when they would hear about Christians having a love feast, this is what came to their mind. A love feast to a Gentile or to someone who doesn't believe in communion, a love feast was pretty much like watching pigs eating at a trough. What do I mean by that? There was gluttony there. There would be a lot of food there that people could just go and eat as much as they wanted to, any times like a big buffet. But the thing of it was is that first come, first serve. And you didn't care who you stepped on or who you pushed to the side. You wanted to get your food first. It's different than our potlucks. In our potlucks, it's order. Sometimes the kids need to eat last. Let the adults go. Honor your elders. Let the older people go first. Don't let the kids go in there and destroy everything. They get what they want. They can learn how to wait too. But at these love feasts that the, that the Greeks did, they would not only have gluttony to eat in, as much as they want to and eat, but they would also have a lot of alcohol flowing. And they would get drunk. So they're eating galore, they're getting drunk galore, but that wasn't the end of it. Then they'd have a big orgy that goes along with their love feasts. So you can kind of imagine the, what was going on at this time in history. But when the Christians talked about having a, a love feast, it was completely different than what the Greeks were used to doing. The Christians' love feast was always a demonstration of their love that they had for Jesus. They knew what Jesus had done for them. And so therefore they would, they'd call it sometimes, a, we have a love fest or a love feast. It's because we love our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave his body and he gave his blood so that we would have eternal life, that our sins would be forgiven. It's so different from the Greeks. And so Paul says this, when it comes to communion, and he mentions this at least three different times in 1 Corinthians at different places. But he says this, that when it comes time for communion, he says, examine oneself. Examine yourself before you participate in the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup. It's basically just saying, why am I doing this? Ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why is this important? Why are you here tonight? Why is this communion different from any other time we have communion? You just have to ask yourself that. Paul goes on and he says, uh, make sure that when you have communion, that you do it in a, worthily, a worthy manner, which just basically means thoughtfully and orderly. That is an, that's a worthy manner. There is a, a way in which you go to communion. It's um, examining yourself and say, Lord, have I sinned? Holy Spirit, show me where I have sinned that I can tell you that, I mean, God already knows, but he wants to hear from you. And then you just say, Lord, I'm, forgive me. Those are, those are healing words. Just that one word. <laughs> well, forgive me, that's two. Forgive me. It's just another way of saying, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, forgive me. Because I know how much you love me and what you did for me on that cross. And I just missed the mark 
so many times. But forgive me for my attitude or whatever it could be. So it's thoughtfully and orderly. It's the things that the Greeks were doing, there was no order, it was chaos. But here we got, when it comes to the love feast that the Christians do, it's orderly. And you, you notice that when we do have communion. There's an order to it. And he says this to them. He goes, recognize the body of the Lord. You are partaking in his body and his blood. It's symbolical for us in ways, but by faith, we take it by faith. It's one of those things that in, in Lutheranism, we just say it's, it's a mystery. We don't know how that all works. But we need to believe that Jesus died for me, and I receive the wafer and what's in the cup, and when you take it by faith, God does something. That's the best I can ever do for you. <laughs> it's a mystery. And Luther said it's just a mystery. We don't know. Now, there's some people that have to have an answer for everything. Sorry. There's some things that are just a mystery. We cannot explain it. We don't know how. We don't know why. And then the last thing, and this is what's very, very important, that you don't find this anywhere else. Paul tells these believers the reason for doing the orderly way in which communion is done and recognizing who Jesus Christ is is because there's a judgment associated with communion. Did you know that? That's why we believe it's very important that we just don't let kids take communion until they know what communion is, what it's about, and why they're doing it. There's a judgment, and Paul even says that's the reason why some of you are sick, and some of you have even died, because you've taken communion in an unworthily way. And Jesus is the only one that can make us worthy. And even then we go like, I'm not worthy to take communion, but Jesus is a lot, he is the one that makes us worthy. It's what he has done, it's who he is. It's not about me. Or you. It's what he's able to do in us and through us. He makes us worthy. And so Paul is just explaining this to, to the new believers. And it doesn't hurt for us sometimes to hear that. Or if you can read it. And if you read something different in the scriptures, then let me know. But I just share it with what's in God's word. So we will receive communion and we'll put to practice some of these things that I've just mentioned here because it comes from God's word. So the first one is examine yourself. Recognize the body and the blood of Jesus that you will be taking by faith tonight. Be serious about what you're doing. Know why you're doing it. Ask yourself, why am I doing this? It should bring me closer to the Lord, not further away from him. And the last one is, uh, there is God's judgment that's associated with communion. So, uh, we're going to do a little bit differently here tonight. Rather than coming up here, you get to sit where you are. If you remember, on the night of Monday, Thursday, it was Jesus at the very beginning of the Lord's Supper, of the Last Supper, what did he do to his disciples? He washed their feet. You can relax. I'm not going to wash your feet. Okay? We're not going to wash your feet. But we're going to come and serve you his, his sacrament. We're going to come and serve you his elements, his body and his blood, to make it more personal. Dean is going to help me do that. So it's just going to be Dean and I. You just sit where you are, and... Uh, And we come to you, if this is possible, if it's possible, this is what I'd like for you to do. Hold the wafer and the cup, if you can. 
I mean, if you can't, it's, you can take it, it's okay. But I want us to just, if you can hold it to the very end, we will all take it together rather than different, wait, different times. We would take it all together. So just hold on to it. But as you're holding on to, on to Jesus, commune with him. Talk with him. Confess what needs to be confessed to him. There will be some music that will be played, right, Sharon? You'll be playing the piano, but you probably don't have enough songs to do this. So if, there is, if she quits playing, there's nothing, relax. That's just the way it is. It's okay to have silence if it should be that way. If you want to go up front to the railing, if you want to pray up there by yourself, you can do that. You can do that. It's just that I won't be up there, and no other council member will be up there either. Because we're going to do it in the pew. You're kind of all sitting in a place that I'm, I'm very glad that you are sitting in places where we can come right in front of you and give you and to serve you. If there was too many of you here, we'd have to go like, okay, get up and get into a different pew so everybody's in every other pew so we can come and serve you. But we're only going to do this only tonight, okay? I don't want anyone to think about, are we going to do this now in April, the first Sunday of the month? No, it's just tonight. So just understand that. It's just for tonight. It'll never be done this way again, probably ever again. I don't know. Um. We will read the Apostles' Creed together before we have communion. And so just um, allow us to serve you first and uh, hold on to it as you can. We'll work this out. Dean, you want to come? I'll let you get next to me here because the first thing we'll do is we'll, we'll read the Apostles' Creed together as a group, if I can find it. Let's say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to go up here. Come up here, Dean. And before we go out, just want to remind everyone of what happened. Just hold on here. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. We have a wafer. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he offered it to his disciples, and he said to them, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the body of Jesus Christ, and this is the blood of Jesus Christ.
Yeah, be careful.
This is the blood of Jesus Christ. Our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now given you his holy body and blood through which he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto everlasting life. Here is what we typically read on a communion Sunday. It's a brief order of confession and forgiveness of sin. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We're going to sing our last song, Have Thine Own Way. It should be in your bulletin, probably on the back page. <clears throat> Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. If you don't know the Lord's Prayer, it is printed on that flyer in your bulletin. But let's pray that, this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy the power, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's the benediction before um, we are dismissed. Comes from Jude, verse 24. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. You are dismissed. Some of you are going like, what do I do with the cup? I'll put it in the back here and you can put the cup back in the basket.
There you go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You can just put it on the table here. You don't. If you want to hold it, you can. But you don't have to.